So thank you very much for that introduction, Leanna, and I'm really happy to be able to talk to you all today about ShoreZone. Um, and there will be some time for questions at the end, as was mentioned, so I'm going to do my best to, to stick to the 45 minutes. I'm, I'm pretty enthusiastic about ShoreZone, so I do enjoy talking about it. So I'm going to start off by just giving you a basic ShoreZone 101, so what is ShoreZone, um, where has it been completed, and then we're going to, I'm going to attempt a live demo of the NOAA ShoreZone website where you can actually access and use this data. If for some reason that doesn't work out so well, I, w I do have some screen captures that I can walk you through the process. And then I'm going to run through some uh, ways in which the ShoreZone data set has been used in the past by uh, both us and by other groups who have used this data set. So, uh, we'll move on there. So basically, what is ShoreZone? So it's a standardized coastal imaging and habitat mapping system. And what we're doing is we're going through and characterizing the physical and biological attributes of the shoreline. And we're doing that in such a way that we're putting into a database that is completely georeferenced, which means that every um, attribute that we're putting in there has a latitude and longitude associated with it, so it can be placed on a particular section of shoreline. So it is a, and it's a searchable database, so if you're looking for a particular attribute, you can actually go and find where those attributes are on the shoreline. The actual imaging itself is done also using a standardized protocol. Um, the imaging is all low altitude. We're flying about 300 feet up and 300 feet out from the shore. So we're looking down at the intertidal zone at an oblique, about approximately 45 degree angle. We're taking both video and stills. So every time we go out, and we try to do this by helicopter because it gives us the uh, capacity to follow a, a highly crenulated shoreline with lots of you know, very complicated shoreline and, and get in and out of all the bays while taking continuous video imagery. And as you can see from our, our photo here, this is a, a picture of uh, a team that was imaging out of Prince Rupert in northern BC. We always have a pilot, obviously, and then sitting next to the pilot in the front seat is the biologist. In that case, that was me in that photo. And the biologist is taking these still images, so has a still high-resolution still camera. And these days, it didn't quite start out this way because when we started Shores on about 30 years ago, um, we were still using film cameras and, in fact, had to um, make them into slides. In fact, when I first started doing Shore Zone, the way we viewed the images was we basically had a darkened area. My first uh, office was in a closet, and we basically had a slide projector sitting next to us, and we projected the slides up onto the wall next to us in order to see them. So technology has changed significantly in the meantime, and we now take approximately one high-resolution photo every three to five seconds, so we have pretty much complete coverage of the shoreline with these photos. Um, and then behind the biologist is a geomorphologist or geologist who is taking continuous high-resolution video. And both of those two people are making commentary about what they're seeing, so the biologist will comment on the biology, and the geomorphologist or geologist will comment on what they're seeing in terms of the physical attributes. And then we usually have a navigator who is sitting there making sure that the georeferencing our GPS is working, um, that all the points are being captured, and also keeping us on track. Sometimes you get into areas with lots and lots of little islands, and you're going around and around and around, and everybody's getting dizzy, and we need to make sure we've actually hit all the shoreline. Um, and actually, we do sometimes get dizzy. Some of those islands are pretty small. Um, so again, we're taking all of this uh, in georeferenced way. So every second, we have a positional fix that's being recorded. And we're also doing this during the lowest tide window possible. Um, we try to fly during the lowest tides of the year. That's not always possible. This particular photo here was taken in the Eastern Aleutian Islands. And we were actually flying in April. Um, so it wasn't the lowest tide possible, although as you can see, it's a very low tide. And they were all below zero tides. Um, but we had to fly earlier in the year to avoid uh, sea lions, an endangered population of sea lions in the area. There are much fewer of them at that time of year, and so we also took pains to avoid all the haul-out areas. So basically, this is what it looks like when we get to the habitat mapping portion of it. So we go out and we take the imagery using the standardized protocol, and then we map it using the standardized protocol. So the idea is what you're seeing here, this line across the screen. Uh, this is the track line of the helicopter. We're actually flying this way. And each one of these blue dots represents the one-second positional fix. And each of the red dots indicates where a photo was taken. So this is the spatial framework around which ShoreZone is based. We then take a digital shoreline, which you can see represented here. This black line here is the digital shoreline of Nunavak Island up in the Bering Sea. 
And we use that imagery to chop up the shoreline into these linear features called units. So we chop up that digital shoreline. You can see each of the units there has a name. And so here's an example of how uh, we delineated unit 2096, which is right here. You can see that bay is this bay right here. And so what happened was here you have a rock platform versus a more bolder headland right here. And so this rock platform was delineated as a separate unit. And that delineation is done based on the physical features, and then we attach biological features on top of that. So there are several uh, levels of habitat mapping. I mentioned that we've got this linear feature, so that's one level. That's what we call the unit level. We, we term each of those uh, linear chunks a unit. But there are also other ways in which we break up that unit. So we subdivide it into zones, which is the supertidal, the intertidal, and the subtitle, with the supertidal being anything, it's the splash zone, basically. The intertidal, obviously, being the area that's um, you know, covered and uncovered by water each day, so it's between the mean high, high water, and the mean low water level. And then anything that is below the water in the imagery is considered subtital. And then even within that, we actually subdivide those zones further into components. So for example, here you have a intertidal which has a rock cliff and then a boulder beach. Each of these will have a significantly different factors that affect them and affect the biology. So they would, in fact, be broken up into two different components of the intertidal zone. So it's a very detailed data set. So some of those physical attributes that we attach are, uh, I'll take you through a few of them. So you can see there's quite a few. There's actually over 40 overall. Um, but some of those are, for example, the substrate. So the size, we use the Wentworth scale. So it's boulder, cobble, sand, um, mud, uh, bedrock, and the per um, we actually do uh, put a, a percent cover in on those. Um, the structuring process, is it the waves that are impacting the shoreline, or is there something else going on, for example, uh, are there glacial processes when we're up in the Bering Sea? Sometimes it's more permafrost, um, or you know, uh, riparian processes. Are we in an estuary where, in fact, the sediment coming from the back shore is more structuring the shoreline? Most of the time, it's wave energy. Um, we put the slope, the width. Uh, the actual exposure of the waves is measured by the fetch of the wind traveling over the water. Geomorphology, is it a rock cliff? Is it a platform? Is it a beach face? Is it a tidal flat? Um, the length of the unit is obviously recorded. And then we have uh, a few things like the oil residence index, which is was developed by John Harper, who uh, was one of the original developers of the shore zone protocol with the BC Ministry of Environment here in British Columbia. And that was developed because shore zone was originally developed as an oil spill response planning tool. Um, and so it's basically telling you how long could oil stay resident on this shoreline should oil come in contact with it, which is one of the reasons we fly at the lowest tides of the year so we can see the entire potential oiling zone. Uh, then we've got, in recent years, we've had uh, things like shoreline modification. So in other words, is there uh, has this beach been restructured somehow? Is there a, a pier? Is there a breakwater, is there a, you know, a, some other kind of anthropogenic structure? And then the coastal vulnerability in recent years. So the more we were working up in the Arctic and the Bering Sea, we started adding some measures of potential vulnerability to sea level rise. So is there anything from the imagery that tells us that there is a greater likelihood of flooding? Is there anything in the imagery that's telling us erosion is actively occurring? And we've all, actually all been putting that together into what we've termed a coastal vulnerability index. Um, which we sort of modified some methodology from the USGS, um, who developed a Coastal Vulnerability Index uh, a number of years back, and tried to modify that using shore zone attributes. So giving a general idea of how vulnerable is this, could this short piece of shoreline potentially be to sea level rise. So that's sort of uh, ways we've been able to use our new sort of more high resolution imagery to gather more information from this. Some of these are uh, unit level, so all of these go in at the unit level. Some of these then go also in at the component level, so we'll describe the entire unit in terms of the oil residence, the index, the slope, the width, the structuring process, and we'll also describe those at the component level. On top of all of that, so as if that wasn't enough, um, we actually put the biology on top of this. So we then have a biologist go through and they put on what are termed biobands. So as you're flying over any shoreline or as you're looking at any shoreline, especially from 300 feet up, the patterns of color um, and where they are in the, in the intertidal zone 
uh, are very clear. And so you can actually see that we have different biomans, for example, a rockweed bioband, which will be a uh, golden brown color in the upper intertidal. You've got but a brown at the waterline is more likely to be a soft brown kelp. Um, so you can see some examples of the different ones we do here. But here's a good example of exactly what we mean by biobands. Obviously, not every beach looks quite this nice. But these are defined by a typical tide height, color, and texture. So what you're seeing here again is that we've got that shiny brown at the waterline that's telling us this is a kelp. Right above that, we've got sort of more of a reddish brown, which is telling us it's actually a red algae mixed with some green. Then we've got sort of this rockweed band, which is actually in, in two slightly different colors because it's mixing with other things down here. Um, we've got some lichen. We've got some salt marsh. There's also a bit of dune grass in there. So we can actually gather a good deal of biological information from these images. So just to give you that idea of what shore zone is, just to give you an idea of where shore zone is, shore zone started in 1979 uh, right here around Victoria where Coastal Ocean Resource is based, uh, and it was tested out by Salt Spring Island. And every year uh, we've added a little bit more. So we started in British Columbia, worked our way uh, all the way up, all the way through the 80s and the 90s. At this point in 1991 is when the biological protocol was added and still photos were added. So up until that point, we had not actually classified biology or taken still photos. It had just been video and, and physical. And at that point, the imagery became good enough that it was decided that biology could in fact be gleaned from the photos. Uh, and then, yep, keep going through BC. And at this point in 1995, we actually started imaging Washington State. Um, which was then completed throughout 1997 and I believe 1999, yeah, there it is. And as we finished BC, uh, we got invited by uh, Sue Sape and Sir Kak, the Cook Inlet Regional Citizens Advisory Committee, our council, to come up to Cook Inlet and start working on Alaska, which is when we started in the sort of more northerly areas and just kept expanding out from there. And then we started re-imaging and remapping some areas because that imagery was then getting very old and that mapping was then getting very old. And obviously, the better the imagery, the better job we can do in determining attributes from it. So as the technology has advanced, we started redoing some areas. Um, and as you can see, we've moved all the way through uh, the most of southeast. We started re-imaging Cook Inlet. At 2011, we imaged Oregon and started moving into the Arctic in 2012. Um, so we've been mostly working through the Bering Sea in the Arctic. And then in 2016, uh, we imaged the Eastern Aleutian Islands and the Mid-Alaska Peninsula. And that was actually the last time we've done uh, some imaging. So that's you can see where the shore zone data set exists. Um, it's actually interesting to note, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, on this, but there are actually ground stations that are done uh, along some of these areas. Uh, we try to do ground stations because obviously when you're flying along at 300 feet, you are interpreting from that image. And you want to make sure that you're trying to realistically capture what that beach would also look like on the ground. You're not going to get the exact information you would get on the ground, obviously. We'd like to make it consistent with what you can see on the ground. So we go out there and do ground stations where we're actually taking measurements, recording substrates and percent covers, and recording the biobands that are there and the biology and the associated species. There's quite a rich data set of, of on-the-ground data that actually exists in this as well. And I'm going to try and show you some of that when we do the online website demonstration. So now that you know where ShoreZone is, how do you actually access it? So this is the actual website. Um, and so it's NOAA. You can also just go into your browser and, and search NOAA ShoreZone. That will take you straight to the website as well. And I'm just going to bring my browser over here. And I've pulled up the website already. So this is the, it's called the Alaska Shore Zone Flex Mapping website, although I will say that you can actually access everything from Oregon, Washington State, and Alaska from this website. So any of the US state shore zone is on here. And there are actually, there is a new JavaScript site that is just being beta tested at the moment, which has some really cool features. I'm not really going to talk about it today because it's not quite ready to go yet. Um, but then there is also a ability to download the ShoreZone GeoDatabase if you would like to, and they're testing this new Carry Map app, which would actually allow you to harness a particular section of shoreline, download all the images and all the mapping, um, the habitat mapping from there, onto your desktop so it could then be taken with you, and you wouldn't need an internet connection in order to access it later. You'd need an internet connection to do the initial download, 
but then you'd be able to access it through your browser from your actual computer while you're out in the field, which of course is very important for people in either remote communities or who are doing work in remote areas. So that is something that can be played with. Again, that's sort of in development at the moment, so I'm just going to stick to the site as it exists currently. And just because it can take a little while to render this map, I went ahead and, and pulled this up. So this is what it will take you to when you click on that start. And you're going to see a map of it starts in Alaska. As I said, you can actually access Washington State and Oregon. It's, it's not obvious from this particular point, so we're going to stick to Alaska for now. At this point, you're going to figure out where you want to go, and you're going to use your tools here to zoom in so you can harness a particular section of shoreline. Again, it can take a few minutes for the video to render, so I am actually have gone ahead and zoomed in, and I pulled this up on a separate page, and now we're going to go ahead and, and take a look at what you can do. So once you've zoomed in far enough, the track line will appear. As you can see, this is the helicopter track line. That's all the points. In this case, the red dots indicate a video point, and the blue dots indicate a photo. And as you can see, an icon appears over here on the screen, um, which indicates the position of the camera. So you have two things down here. You've got a video snapshot, which is where, where the video is at that exact point, and you've got a photo snapshot, which indicates the closest photo to that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the video from here, and let's see how we do on this. All right, there we go. And I'm just going to toggle the photos, so that what's going to happen is the photos are going to automatically move along with it. Sometimes, that, there we go, so it's just caught up. So as you can see, these camera icons are moving along, and as they move along, we're seeing the exact imagery that was taken of that section of shoreline. This is a section of Homer Spit in Kachemak Bay. Uh, I thought I'd put it in there because sometimes looking at images of places people might actually know is a little bit more interesting, um, even though there's tons of beautiful photos of the shoreline. So as you're going along, you can see all that imagery. You could skip to another place if you wanted to come over here, start playing all the photos or the video from there. At any point, you can also pause these. I'm just going to pause that. And you can take a look. You can make it bigger if you'd like to see a, a bigger view of it. You can also download all of the photos. So this little icon in the corner, this save icon, would allow you to download that high, the high-resolution version of the photo, which is not what's displaying here, I should add, <laughs> because it takes up too much streaming space. But you can actually download the high resolution version of this photo, of any of the photos on here. There are approximately, thinking somewhere in the order of about 700,000 photos on here. Um, and there was, I believe we actually once calculated it would take someone to watch all the video that's on the NOAA Shore Zone website, uh, would take 50 days of continuous watching. <laughs> So there is an awful lot of video on here as well. If anyone ever has 50 days in which they're sitting around not doing anything else. Um, and so as you can see, there is that layer of data in here, and that's the layers that is turned on here. So if you want to see the still photos and video, you turn these layers on. I'm just going to turn them off for a second because they do take up a lot of uh, space on here and processing time. And so what I'm going to do then is show you the other part, which is the habitat mapping. So we do, in fact, have habitat mapping on here. This gray line is the digital shoreline. Um, underneath it is a, a topographic map, which actually includes some of the intertidal zone. But the digital shoreline is the high water line. So if you wanted to see, for example, let's do an oil residence index, since that is a, a nice, a relatively simple one. You simply click on that layer. You will see that that pops up with some coloration. Uh, if you want to expand that legend, you click on those green arrows there, and it gives you that the going light to dark is shorter persistence to longer persistence. So anything in here, for example, is going to be persistence from months to years. It's a very low energy environment. There's, I happen to know that this is a sort of riprap boulder. In fact, if you want to see what it looks like, all we have to do is go over to the photos. Um, and there you go. That's the area we're looking at. So if you want to see why this is a high residence shoreline, you can simply go to the photo and take a look. Um, some of the other attributes that we have on here are obviously our biological attributes. So for example, if you're looking for everywhere there is green algae, you can turn that one on. And you can see here that the legend, a solid green line is continuous, a dotted green line is patchy, so there's patchy green algae through here. 
Um, let's see if we've got any soft brown kelp in here. Soft brown kelp. Yep, we've got some patchy soft brown kelp all along this section. This is where would be the hardened sections of shoreline. So you can actually see that there is quite a um, Im impressive set of data. Um, you can also break it down by the surveys that were done, um, which tells you which years survey years it was done, there's uh, some ports and towns, um, there's all kinds of other information, stellar sea lands, fallouts, those kinds of things. So there's quite a bit of information in here. If you're looking for something specific, there's also a layer query tab where you can actually build a query and it will ask you which uh, attributes you're looking for and what specific values you're looking for and then you can actually return that query. Um, so that's sort of a lot of the information that's on here is accessible through these two particular tabs. And it gives you the unit description table. So everything that is viewable in this particular screen, you can actually see the links, the habitat class, biological wave exposure. So you can see all those attributes, the full set of attributes down here. So there is a lot of data to be mined here. And as I said, if you're looking for a specific region, there is now that ability to go to the carry map app as I put that here. So if we go into this site, so there's actually a few areas that these are demo maps for the carry map app. At a, a certain point in the future, this will be, uh, near future, this will be the ability to actually harness a particular <clears throat> chunk of shoreline you're interested in, download all that data. And you can also download the full geodatabase. It is 800 megabytes, so I would highly recommend a fast internet connection and a lot of time if you're going to do that. You can also contact the people at NOAA, so there is some contact information up here if you wish to request a, a hard copy on disk be sent to you. So that is the NOAA Shore Zone Fisheries website. Uh, it's a very rich data set. I would highly recommend, as I mentioned, there is the shore station data, in fact, in there as well. Um, we're a little bit far out to see it, as it takes a little bit of time to process sometimes, so I, I didn't want to... Uh, <laughs> there we go. So in each one of these boxes, it shows you where all the accessible shore station information is in Alaska. And if you want, you can zoom in further. Uh, so for example, we're going to use here, because Southeast Alaska. You'd be able to actually click on one of these sites and find the information available for those. So as we zoom in, to get a little bit closer. Sometimes you need to be fairly close before the uh, actual stations will load. Yeah, I was having trouble with this yesterday as well. It, it, it's taking a very long time to load, and so it did eventually load on my computer yesterday, but I know they've been having a, a few issues with the, the shore station data. It's, it's, oh, there we go. Finally popped up. Yay! So what it's going to do is it's going to pop up with all the different regions. It's highlighting the region that I'm in. Um, in that case, if you want to go to the shore station locales, you're going to it's going to show you all the shore stations in southeast. And then if you want to go to that particular station, for example, here in uh, uh, Moira Sound, it's going to zoom you straight to those Moira Sounds. And then there's three in there. And as you pass over them, it's going to highlight which one you're on. And then you can even go in there. You can see all the photos from that shore station. Um, you can see the species that were listed from that shore station. Um, so there we go. We've got some photos appearing there. So you can scroll through the photos from that site. And uh, if you want to go to the species, it pops up every species that was recorded at that particular site. So this is a very rich data set that can be mined uh, online. So I'm just going to go back to my PowerPoint presentation now. And I can always take questions about that later. Um, and just give you some ideas of how this data has actually been used by people over the last 30 years. So one thing that uh, Coastal and Ocean says is that every time we survey and complete mapping on a new area, we provide a summary report, which are also all available through the NOAA Shore Zone website. There's a whole tab on where the summary reports are. And flight reports. Uh, so every time we go up flying, we also send a report. Uh, even if NOAA was not one of the funders, uh, it has been agreed by everyone that this will be the repository for those uh, pieces of information. So this is Norton Sound up in the Bering Sea. Uh, we finished mapping on that just this year. This is actually one of the most recent areas. So what we do is we create attribute maps. So you can see here, this is the Oil Residence Index attribute map. 
Um, it makes them a lot of sense. There's a lot of sediment shorelines that you're going to have a lot of the higher uh, oil residents. Here where there's some more hard packed sand, obviously, you're, and it's more exposed, you're going to get lower oil residence index. So from these larger scale maps, you can get some general trends. Uh, this is the Coastal Vulnerability Index. I mentioned that this is one of our newer attributes. It's an amalgamation of several other attributes that we uh, have used. This is uh, from the yukon Coquim Delta area, which again is in the Bering Sea. We completed mapping on that last year. Uh, and this is showing again that you know there's some um, uh, higher uh, vulnerable areas to sea level rise along the outer coast. This is basically one gigantic marsh as far as the eye can see. And these more exposed outer coastlines with very flat back shores come up as higher uh, in terms of vulnerability to sea level rise. Whereas the rockier coasts of Nunavak Island come out as lower. Um, if you're looking at uh, bio bands, so here is a map of the Eastern Aleutians. So just noting that we haven't quite finished the mapping on that yet, working on that currently at the moment. Um, You've got bull kelp occurring, we've got dragon kelps, there's the two different species of canopy kelps, and there are cases in which they actually co-occur, which is the red here. Um, it is interesting to note that, uh, of course, the dragon kelp is generally in the lower exposure areas, the bull kelp is going to be in the higher exposure. So out on the Pacific side here, you're generally just seeing the bull kelp because the, it's too high exposure for the dragon kelp. Whereas the interior of these islands, where they're a little bit more protected, you start seeing both species. So some interesting trends that can be noted even at this uh, far range. And then also an interesting thing we noted was that urchin barrens were only occurring on the bearing sides of the islands. It was actually the difference in the sides of the two islands in terms of the biology was very pronounced when we were out there. I could tell the instant we were flying around, I could tell the instant we flew onto the bearing side of an island because we'd start to see uh, a very different looking shoreline and the urchin barrens start appearing. So it was kind of a, an interesting uh, dichotomy between the two. It's also really interesting flying at some of the lowest tides because basically, you know, the entire Bering Sea would be trying to pour into the entire Pacific Ocean through these narrow channels. And there were some incredible standing waves and rip tides going through there. It was made me grateful I was not on a boat, truthfully. So some of the applica other applications for shore zone data, other than just the creation of these general trend habitat maps, uh, has been oil spill planning and response. As I mentioned, that was the initial use, uh, initial conceived use for shore zone. So uh, just to give you a concrete example of a time when uh, that was used, the Culloch oil rig, when it broke free, uh, was floating towards the shore, and they needed actually a place where they weren't going to be able to tow it offshore, and they needed a place to ground it uh, at a point along the shoreline that was going to be uh, safest. So they needed a place that was not going to be you know, immensely rocky, so it hopefully wouldn't break up. But they also wanted somewhere that didn't have a lot of sensitive species or was you know, at high risk of, of oil residents. So they actually used the shore zone mapping to figure out a, and the shore zone imagery to figure out a good safe spot and then were able to push it up onto the shore until the storm had passed and they were able to tow the rig off. Uh, the Marathasa spill, which occurred in the Vancouver Harbor, uh, was also a, a time it was, it was right in the middle of the harbor. It actually hit a couple of areas of, of highly used shoreline. Um, it was another time that uh, shore zone was used in terms of the risk management. Some other applications have been mapping of marine debris. So uh, if we happen to see marine debris from the imagery, we always uh, record it. But of course, marine debris is often quite small, not necessarily noticeable from 300 meters up. But the National Park Service actually took uh, our recording of log lines because we record logs in the uh, splash zone. And so they actually modeled areas of higher potential debris uh, where there were larger log lines. So in other words, if there were, you know, as a 30 meter log line all, you know, accumulated at the end of this inlet, it can be safely assumed that there's a good bit of marine debris trapped up in there as well because it's the catcher beach. So this is the maps that they produced based on that data. Um, obviously, coastal vulnerability, uh, this is the community of Kivalina. Uh, so we were able to uh, record shoreline modifications and hopefully people can use the imagery to look back later after storm events, I was actually just looking at some, there were some major storm events and due to the lack of ice um, during the winter at this point up in the Bering Sea there, and the, the Chukchi Sea, there have actually been a number of uh, damaging storm events up there and I actually was going back and looking at some of the shores on imagery from past surveys and the difference was actually quite pronounced. So there were some areas where they lost several roads and things like that that were uh, formerly, you know, 20 meters in from the, the, the ocean. 
Um, some other applications that have been more recent is cultural features mapping. So this is an area of the northern part of British Columbia around Prince Rupert. So Prince Rupert is actually right here. Uh, and this is actually the uh, border uh, up here with, uh, this is where Southeast Alaska begins. Um, and so it was the community of Metlakatla, which is actually right in here. And they actually used the shore zone imagery to go in and they were mapping uh, things like canoe runs, fish traps, clam gardens, middens, village sites, which were all um, uses of the intertidal zone and sometimes even a subtidal zone that hadn't previously been inventoried in their traditional ha territory. So they were actually using this um, and we set them up with a GIS mapping program where they're able to record it and record the images that occurred in for their own uh, planning purposes. So that was a pretty cool, uh, and it was amazing how these just jumped out at you from higher up in the air. You could be standing on the beach and it wouldn't be clear that a feature was uh, you know, a cultural feature that had been actually created deliberately, but from up in the air they just jumped right out at you, especially the clam gardens, those big boulder lines that were right at the bottom of the beach that were holding in the sediment to, to make for a better clam habitat were really quite impressive and there were tons of them in the area. Um, some other applications have been habitat modeling. So as I mentioned, we have all of this uh, the data. Um, a group here in British Columbia uh, called the Hakai Institute went through and they actually took our linear data with eelgrass. So this is actually a map of the eelgrass bioband distribution in British Columbia. And this is everywhere that shore zone recorded eelgrass. It should be noted that before we started recording biobands, for example, down here in the southern strait of Georgia, um, it looks like there is no eelgrass, and of course there is a lot of eelgrass in there, but biobands weren't recorded. So we're actually looking to hopefully re-image and remap those areas fairly soon so that we can add that data uh, to this data set. And what they did is they took the linear features and did some really cool um, modeling with, uh, you know, the, the using the charts and basically figuring out how deep the eelgrass could potentially go and creating polygons. I won't try and bore you with the actual uh, steps they went through to do it, but it was a pretty neat, uh, so they've actually created potentially, and they're doing this for a uh, blue carbon mapping exercise. Uh, some other applications um, were, for example, identifying unusual habitats or ones that had not previously been studied. So this is kind of a neat one with Kamishak Bay and Cook Inlet, where these big giant reefs that are way far offshore, and it turns out pretty much nobody had been out there at uh, low tides, or certainly no one had seen them from the air at the lowest tides. And when we mapped it, we found this red algae bioband that was just, it, it stood out as, as very unusual. And when they got down on the ground, they found it was basically this monoculture of this one particular type of red algae, which occurs in other areas, but not in this kind of profusion or abundance. It actually had a very unique community associated with it. So they're actually able to target this and create a whole uh, research program designed around this unusual feature and knowing that they had to get out there at the lowest tides in order to be able to study it and find out exactly where it was and you know what the importance might be. And so far, um, to the best of anyone's knowledge, it hasn't been found anywhere else in Alaska. So it's a very unique place um, that was identified using shore zone imagery. We also find that a lot of researchers find shore zone imagery and mapping extremely useful for study design. Uh, in order to say, for example, I'm looking for a beach or an area that matches these particular criteria, and then you can then go in and use the shore zone data to narrow it down and look at the imagery and figure out if their sites actually match that criteria before they even get out there. So they can do a lot of pre-planning. That's something that's been uh, very useful in the past. Some other species modeling, something we've been working on with the World Wildlife Fund recently was forage fish modeling, habitat modeling. So this is for modeling spawning, suitable spawning beaches or potentially suitable spawning beaches. So we took all that data and we figured out where it's possible that uh, forage fish might spawn, and then we've been using some ground data that was collected in the area to try and, and ground truth the model and try and refine it a bit more. Um, outreach and education has been a huge uh, way that shore zone has been used, so I don't know if anyone here has seen the coastal impressions or the Arctic impressions um, photo displays that, that went around. Uh, but basically, it's a booklet. It's accessible through the NOAA shore zone website as well. Um, as a digital copy is, and it's basically taking these beautiful photos that we've taken from all over the coast and interpreting them and providing some context to them. Also has been done as Arctic impressions, once Shorzone moved into the Arctic, started uh, doing this, uh, and basically providing people some context to these photos and how to interpret these photos. And it was also uh, 
given to a series of local artists in Anchorage who actually, so three different artists who would paint the same um, shore zone photo and seeing what each of the artists actually got out of it and, and what drew their eye as artists was really quite fascinating. Um, in recent years, we have been using Structure from Motion, which is a software designed to stitch photos together uh, into a photo mosaic, and then with each one of them georeferenced, it can actually create a three-dimensional model of the shoreline um, simply from the imagery. Uh, so let me see if I can, there we go, I'm just going to play this for you. So you can actually see that that imagery can then be used, this is not the most high uh, relief shoreline here, but you can actually take this three-dimensional model, you can turn it around, you can look at it. Um, it's pretty incredible. This was actually only done just using one second captures from the video. So this wasn't even using a lot of our high resolution of photos. So we're, we're working on a way to stitch those together to really make a pretty cool digital elevation model product. Um, all right, there we go. And this has actually been done, this, this type of use of coastal imagery has been done in California, where they've actually been going out and taking high resolution photos specifically for this purpose. And they've been able to create not just a digital elevation model, but several over time to actually look at changes in the shoreline in terms of erosion and accretion. Um, and you know where the coastline and the backshore is changing. It's it's a very cool and interesting new application um, of the imagery that we're looking at. And then just last one, and then I will give you a chance to uh, ask some questions. Um, this is a really cool application that just came up in the last year. So we had a student contact us who is working with NASA, uh, PhD student, and what he is he was trying to do was test a technology by which the ground rovers they're planning to send to Mars could navigate without GPS. Because, of course, when you land a rover on Mars, you don't have that group of satellites up there that are providing constant GPS coverage. So how does the rover know where it is? It turns out what they were planning to do was send this helicopter drone to take high or, or relatively low altitude photos, so around about 300 to 500 feet, which is exactly where shore zone photos are taken. Um, but then the question became then, in a, in a landscape that is fairly similar, can you write an algorithm that would actually allow that rover to use all of these very similar photographs to navigate? So we, he actually accessed the shore zone data set and contacted us and tested this out. And so there it was a few areas where there was actually two different sets of photos. And he actually wrote an algorithm that could recognize, and you know, a lot of the coast of Alaska from 300 feet up, especially the more remote coastline, there's a lot of similarities between a lot of the beaches out there. So as he was going along, he was writing an algorithm that would actually allow, for example, a plane that was flying in at low altitude to recognize where it was, because all these photos are georeferenced. Um, the question is, is, could it recognize the photo taken out of context and without the georeferencing just from using different points, taken at a completely different time? So we actually used one of the areas we have two overlapping sets of shore zone photos and was able to write this algorithm and apparently has been very successful at it. So it turns out that some technology that was refined using shore zone photos could end up being used on Mars. So that was a pretty cool <laughs> cool project to find out about. And then basically after that, it's, it's up to the individual imagination uh, of, of how this data set could be used. I'm particularly looking forward to having some more time series I think there's some really interesting uh, spatial statistics work that we could get into, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing some of that happening in the future. So I think that was everything for me, so I would certainly be very happy to take uh, any questions at this time. If you're on the phone line asking a question, you may be on mute. Yes. We've got one here in Anchorage. So this is Wendy with the Arctic LCC, and I was I just have a question about the structure from motion analyses. And so the high resolution digital images, I mean the SFM part of it is really the computer processing of those images to create the the kind of DEM image? That's correct, yes. So the Structure for Motion is the name of the program that you basically plug those images into. And uh, of course, up until this point, we haven't collected the high-resolution still images 
to have the approximately 50% overlap that's required for structure for motion. Um, we are planning to actually modify the protocol for the future so that we are in fact collecting them in a way that can be fed directly into the program, which is why up until recently we started taking the one second video captures. So we would take the video and, and take one second still captures and then stitch those together. But obviously it would be better with higher resolution imagery. Fantastic, thank you. I have a quick question. I just wanted to clarify um, the ability to be able to download a certain or a specific spatial extent um, from the shore zone and put it on your de desktop so you can use it in remote areas. Is that going to be accessible through the Carry Map app? Yes, it is going to be okay. accessible through the Carry Map app. So at the moment, there's just a few. Um, let me see if I can pull that up. There's just a few uh, demo areas available. Okay. Um, but they're developing it so that you would actually be able to um, harness the particular, so basically it would be the extent of the shoreline that you have in your viewer at that moment would okay. be what's downloaded onto your desktop. Just curious, do you have a sense of when that may be ready? Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, so Steve Lewis is the person at NOAA who's been working on this. And of course, you know, anything that goes through beta testing is, always takes a little bit of a while. It's been in development for about a year now, I think. Um, and now it's actually up on the, the site, which is great for people to test. So they actually have it in the beta testing phase at the moment. And, and it is the hope that within a couple of months it will be up and functional and available to the public. Great, thank you. No problem. Hey, uh, Sarah, this is Tom Rothy. Hi. Hey, um, can you give me a, 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 like a contact bit if I want to reach somebody to brainstorm some application stuff for ShoreZone? Oh, well, you can certainly contact me. Um, if you would like someone within NOAA, um, Mandy Lindberg um, would be a great person. Uh, Sue Safe at CIRCAC is also a great person to sort of, uh, she's, been a tremendous supporter and has been involved in a lot of the projects over the years, even ones that aren't in her traditional area. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd certainly be happy to do that as well. But I can certainly, um, if you've got my email there up on screen, just shoot me an email and I can provide you with some of those names and, and any feedback that you'd like. Okay, uh, Pacific Birds Habitat Joint Venture is trying to figure out how to do a bit of a, an estuary catalog that goes from mm -hmm. North California to uh, at least Cook Inlet. So. <laughs> We're interested in, yeah. in uh, how we can take um, a lot of your data is linear, and so what we're really looking for is polygons that would define estuaries and then attach attributes to those and rate them and stuff. Yeah, definitely. Well, I can see, you know, it's interesting because I can see that some of the eelgrass work that uh, the Hakai Institute did here um, was turning linear features into polygons. Uh, so they're, they're could be a potential application. I mean, as long as you have uh, decent elevation data, might be able to do the same thing um, with a digital shoreline and some elevation uh, data in a GIS application. But yeah, that would there's definitely some people I can think of that I could put you in contact with um, who, who might be able to help with that. And okay, I'll shoot you an email. Great, thank you. This is Liana uh, in Anchorage. There's just FYI, an app called Coast View that Amelie Kuvion, um developed, and it's great for outreach purposes. And so folks can, as they're traveling the shoreline, they can go and look at photos, and um, you can download it. So as you're flying over an area, you can look at the photos while you while you fly, or you can. It's just a great way to explore. Um, so the app again is called Coast View. Yeah, that's a, a terrific way that uh, the shore zone photos have been used. I've got a question about the oblique imagery metadata. Uh, when you download a set of images, um, I guess how does it? How do you know locations, and how do you sort of connect uh, those pieces to the images? All the images um, that are available for download are in fact geotagged. So if you have a an, an imagery program like ACDC or something like that that can read the metadata, it is actually all tagged onto those photos. Um, so there should be a Latin long associated with in, in the file data for each of those photos. Awesome, thanks. No problem. Uh, 